We're going to be talking about flowing fluids today as contrasted to the static fluids we've been studying the previous days. And I want to start where we left off last class period with the idea of capillarity. Capillary action is caused by the surface tension, that is, by the energy being lower when you have water touching glass than when you have water touching water. And so we talk about this with a parameter that we call the surface energy or surface tension gamma. So that's the surface energy or surface tension. And the reason it has that word surface tension is because it behaves like tension does. We learned that tension puts a force on an object where it leaves the object in the direction that it's leaving. And surface tension does the same thing. What's different about, different about surface tension compared to regular tension is that regular tension is, is going to be just a one-dimensional thing. It's in the direction the string is. Whereas the surface tension is for a two-dimensional surface. So if, for instance, I have a ring and it's in water, I will have surface tension creating a force on that ring everywhere that the water touches the ring. So if I look at that, it's a ring, it's an empty ring, so water is going to be on the inside and the outside. So the length of contact is going to be equal to the inner circumference plus the outer circumference. So for this ring, the length is equal to 2 times the circumference 2 pi r. And so the force that the water is going to put on this is going to have all of that length. Now, if the ring is sitting at water level, so it's not trying to pull up, not trying to push down, then I'd have the directions of that force canceling out, and it would be you know, useless to me to try to figure anything out. But we can have things like, if you put that ring on water, if it's a very thin ring, it'll float. Last class period, we learned about floating. What was the basic condition for something to float? It has to have a lower density than the fluid. But if I have an iron ring that's a small ring, it will float, even though the iron has a higher density. So it's not floating because of buoyancy. It's floating for something else. In this case, it would be the surface tension. So when you put the iron ring on the water, it's going to naturally try to drop down. But as it does, if I look at the side of the rings, so that's looking at a cross section of the ring, the water is going to come up and form some angle that's you know not horizontal anymore. Then I'm going to have a portion of the surface tension force. Oh, that was supposed to be a straight line. That was perfectly non-straight. A portion of that surface tension force that is in the direction that is vertical and a portion that's horizontal. So if I take this and break it into horizontal and vertical portions, I have, let's call the angle here theta. Then the horizontal part would be gamma L, the force, times cosine of theta. The vertical part would be gamma L times sine of theta. And if I go all the way around that ring, the horizontal parts are again going to add out to zero. But the vertical parts are all the same direction, so they're going to add together. And so I would then take this and say, okay, the vertical force is going to be gamma L sine theta, and L is equal to two times the circumference because I have the inside and the outside. So that would be gamma times 4 pi r times sine theta. And that's the actual upward force that would be pushing up on that ring. What sets the angle theta? Well, if it hasn't sunk, the angle theta is set so that the net force in the ring is zero. So you have the gravitational force downward and the surface tension force upward. And the angle adjusts to make those equal to each other. <coughs> Until you get to the angle being a vertical. If you have the water coming straight up, then, of course, your entire surface tension force, the gamma 4 pi r, would be vertical. 
And if you try to put any more weight than the maximum you get from that, then it will sink. So this is actually how things like water striders. I don't know about you guys. As a kid, we'd go out there to Yosemite camping. I'd see all the water striders standing on the water. And I wondered how in the world do they do that? And they do that because of surface tension. They have their pads. So their pads are basically just a sphere. And then they're in the water and the water goes like this. And there's the surface tension force pushing up on those pads. And that's what keeps them from sinking in. And if you're evil, like I was as a kid, you push them under and then you're like, but how come they don't come back up? <laughs> yes, but I did mean physics experiments. You guys have heard the cats always land on their feet, right? I took our cat and I dropped it off of the first step and off of the second step and off of the third step, each time holding it by its feet and dropping it back down. And my, my research turns out to be in agreement with the PTA approved research, PETA, whatever, PETA, where they actually drop them on soft things. Um, that is, after about four steps, it always landed on its feet. Beforehand, it didn't. You guys know why? We studied it already. Yeah. The cats are very flexible and they use the whole idea of conservation of angular momentum to their advantage. They straighten out their body so they have very little moment of inertia and they twist things and then they bring them back and they use conservation of angular momentum to be able to right themselves. But it takes time and so from the first couple of steps they didn't have time to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little scientist. I was like eight. <laughs> All right. Looking at this capillary action, I mentioned it last class period. What's holding the water up? It's going to be the surface tension. And that water is going to rise until you have the maximum surface tension available, which means you have the angle is vertical. And so you can look at this and you can say, okay, the upward force here, this is not a ring. It's inside of a cylinder. So what's the contact length between the cylinder and the water? It's just a single circle. The circumference, which is 2 pi r. So my contact length here is going to be L equals 2 pi times the radius. So the upward force... is going to be the surface tension times that contact length of, whoops, hand hit wrong place, 2 pi r. That's the upward force. Now I'm going to have a downward force that's going to be the weight of that column of water that has been lifted. And so the downward force, perfectly downward force, is equal to mg, which is going to be the density of my fluid times the volume times g well the volume in the cil cylinder is the area pi r squared times the height and so for us to reach equilibrium we always are going to have to have some of the forces i'm going to do this i have to define the y direction the y direction equals mass times acceleration the y direction is zero Looking at my very clumsily drawn free body diagram, that's force of surface tension minus the force down due to gravity equals zero. Then putting in gamma two pi, no, oh, gamma two pi r minus rho of the fluid pi r squared hg equals zero, which then allows me to solve for the height I will have due to capillary action. That height is just going to be notice I can cancel out the pies and I can cancel out the one of the radii and I have this whoops that's a gamma yeah. so that's equal to two gamma over density of the fluid radius times g. So the height that I'm going to have for that column, I can calculate based on the radius of the tube. The bigger the radius, the lower the height, right? 
because it's in the denominator position, and on the density of the fluid, and on the surface tension. So I wanted to cover that from the last class break. Any questions? Paris. Can you go back to balance? All right, moving along. Just an explanation of how some of this pressure things affect us in daily lives. When we breathe, we can only breathe because there's air pressure outside. If there's no air pressure pushing in on us, we couldn't breathe because what we do is we have this muscle in here. I don't know about you guys, but when I was in high school, my choir teacher was, you know, you got to sing from your diaphragm and all that. We have this muscle and that muscle pulls down, which then makes the volume of your lungs expand. That lowers the pressure in your lungs. The air pressure outside pushes air in because you have a higher pressure outside than the pressure inside. And so air pressure is what fills your lungs, air pressure outside of you. And then when you exhale, you push back up, increase the pressure in your lungs, and it comes out. So breathing itself is a function of pressure. No air pressure, you, you can't breathe. It doesn't, you know, doesn't work. And now fluid flow. We're going to talk about fluid flow for the rest of the day. And so fluid flow, it's a pretty easy idea. You have a fluid, which by definition is anything that flows. And then we're going to look at it flowing. And we have what we call a continuity relationship that says, as long as I don't have any cavitation, if I'm not producing bubbles in there or cavities, then I should have the volume of fluid that's flowing remains constant. And so to calculate the the fluid flow rate, which we use the symbol Q for, we just say, well, that's going to be the volume per unit time that passes a specific location. So you can see here the area, my location would be like right here, and over some time delta T, the fluid has moved the distance D. And so the volume that is passed in time delta T is just going to be the area times the distance it moved in time t divided by the time. But of course, distance over time is speed. So the, the flow rate here, and we call this the volume flow rate because it was volume per time, is just area times the speed. And as water goes through pipes, as long as you don't branch off, you should have the same volume per time passing through. If you didn't, you would be blowing something up or having something contract, you know, like you could blow up a balloon. Well, yeah, then you're not going to have constant flow rate. But if you have fixed pipes, the flow rate needs to be the same everywhere. Now, that's the, the volume flow rate. We also sometimes talk about the mass flow rate because if you have a compressible fluid, and of course, all fluids to some degree are compressible. So if I have a compressible fluid, it's actually going to be the mass that passes per time that's going to need to remain constant. If you compress it, then you'll have less volume. And so if we do the mass flow rate, so this here is the volume flow rate. Let me put a subscript of V. Since mass is equal to the density multiplied by the volume, the mass flow rate is exactly the same thing, except for its density times the area times the speed. And don't worry, the V on top is their way of saying the average speed. It's a technicality we don't need to worry about. So we have these two related ideas of flow rate, that the flow rate has to be constant if we don't have cavities forming and if we're not having you know, a changing size of our material. That's going to be important to us as we look at things like the Bernoulli relation. So... Here's a pictorial example showing what happens with the flow rate conservation. Here I have a big tube that goes down to a small tube. The flow rate has to be the same, so I have to have flow rate 1 is equal to area of 1 times speed 1. That needs to be equal to flow rate 2, which is area 2, multiplied by speed 2. So I can take these and quickly relate the speeds, for instance, a1, V1 has to be A2, V2. Hence, V2 must be equal to V1 times 
a1 over a2. And so I can relate the speeds in these just by looking at those numbers. Now, something similar to this, there's a homework problem that I may or may not assign that has to do with the heart pumping blood through the body and that blood, of course, going through the aorta and then being split out to multiple arteries. If I have the blood from one artery split out into seven smaller arteries, the flow rate in the aorta has to be the sum of the flow rates in each of the individual arteries, so the total flow rate is the same. So if you have a branch, you can take that into account. You just have to say the total flow rate, so adding up all of the flow rates after has to be the same as the flow rate before. Any questions about flow rate? Excellent. Get to stuff that's more fun. Bernoulli's principle. <laughs> True story. When I was in graduate school, I worked for nine months in the Department of Energy Lab, and we had to have safety lectures every month. The government mandated it, but they didn't mandate what the safety had to be. So one of the safety lectures that I had to go attend was train safety. And so they brought in somebody from like, I don't know, South Pacific or some train company to talk about train safety. And they showed us all these videos of people getting hit by trains. Yeah, that's not funny, right? Not funny. Want to make sure we're clear on that. But the thing is, a lot of times, now sometimes people are just idiots, like, oh, there's a train coming, I can beat it. Yeah, that's not smart. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people are just not paying attention and they'll stand, here's the train track, and they'll say, well, I'm off the train track, but I want to be close because I want to be the first one in. They'll stand real close to the train track. And when the train comes by, if they're not paying attention, they can fall into the train. Now, the question is, why would they fall into the train? And the answer is the Bernoulli principle. I watched a video this morning talking about a very common experience we have. You take a shower. What happens to that shower curtain when you take the shower? It pulls into you. Isn't that annoying? Yes. That's because of the Bernoulli effect. So what's the Bernoulli effect? Effect. Daniel Bernoulli, I believe it was, lots of Bernoullis out there, noted that when you have a higher wind speed, you have a lower pressure. And we're going to work out the math to show that it actually works out. That's the way it is. The higher pressure or the higher wind speed, the lower the pressure is. And so with the example of the train, if you're standing here and the train comes by, the train is going really fast. So the wind that's being pulled by the train between you and the train is going to be moving faster than the air behind your body. Bernoulli principle says that means lower pressure between you and the train and you and the other side of your body, smaller pressure one side than the other means you're going to have a net force that pushes you into the train. So let's look at the derivation of the Bernoulli equation. The derivation is a simple application, simple, of the work energy relation, not wonk, really not wonk. So we should all know, what is the work-energy relation? Um, no, power is work over time, but that's not the work-energy relation. It's a really important thing that we had in the last test. Okay, and that's the form I, I'm going to use. The network is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. So I have this tube here with this green fluid in it, and there's a pressure one on the left side, a pressure two on the right side, and I'm going to calculate the network that is done on this fluid by pressure one and pressure two. So the first step is the network. What's the equation for work? Okay, work is the force times the distance parallel. So I put force delta x parallel. Now, if we look in this picture, I'm going to use the symbols in the picture. So on the left side, the A1, P1 side, 
what direction is the force going to be? Is it going to be parallel or anti-parallel to x1? It's going to be parallel. So my force, by definition, pressure is force divided by area. So the force on that surface is the pressure multiplied by the area. So I'm going to have work 1 is equal to pressure 1, area 1. That's the force 1 multiplied by the distance it moves, x1. And because they're parallel, that's positive. And of course, if you want to put the cosine theta, it'd be times cosine of zero degrees because they're the same direction. So that's work one. Now, if we look at the top here for two, what direction is that force compared to the distance it moves? Anti-parallel. So that means 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 degrees is minus one. So I'm going to have work two is going to be pressure two, area two, times x2, and then I have to put that minus sign because they're opposite directions. So if I add those two together, I'll get my network So there I have the work part of the work energy relation. Now I need to look at kinetic energy and potential energy changes. So if I want to look at the potential energy change, I'll look at the same picture here on the left-hand side. What effectively happened was this piece of water here, or fluid, whatever it is, moved up to this position. So I'm going to have the mass of that piece went from down low to up high. So if I calculate my change in potential energy, yeah, go back to blue, maybe. So change in potential energy is final minus initial. So I'm going to take the potential energy of the mass in the top first. So that's going to be the mass is density of my fluid times the volume which is going to be area 2, x2. That's the volume of this in the higher position. It's area 2, and x2 is how much it moved. So that's the mass times g multiplied by its elevation, which is actually shown in this picture over to the right as h2. So that's my final potential energy, and I need to subtract my initial potential energy which is going to be the mass, which I put density of the fluid. And I'll put A1X1 for the area there because it's area 1 and X1 that moves. And then I have to have G times H1. So there's my change in potential energy. Finally, the change in kinetic energy. Change in kinetic energy, it's one-half mass. So for the mass, it'll be the same One-half mass times, and what's the last part, kinetic energy? The speed squared. And then my initial no G. So I have my work net, my change in kinetic energy, my change in potential energy calculated. Now I just put these into the work energy relation. So I'm going to have So that's the change in kinetic energy, and then down below it I'll put the change in potential energy. Now this is a long, annoying equation, but let us not forget our continuity relation that says A1, well, A1V1, 
equals a two v two, right? Now, if I multiply, you got a question? Uh, you left the L. Where did the L? I did. You are correct. Thank you. Because eventually, I would have been really annoyed with myself. There. Thank you. Okay, taking this continuity relationship, a one v one equals a two v two. I'm just going to multiply both sides by time. And multiplying both sides by time, V1 multiplied by time is X1. V2 multiplied by time is X2. So I'm going to have A1 X1 equals A2 X2. And every term has that in it. So all of those things I circled are equal. I can cancel them out. Now I'm going to do the last step, put all the things that have a subscript one on the left side, all things with subscript two on the right side. And I have P1, the first term. And then over here, this was minus one half rho of the fluid V1 squared. So bring it across and it's going to be plus one half rho of the fluid V1 squared. And likewise, this was negative for the potential energy. So it'll be a plus rho of the fluid GH1 equals P2 plus one half rho of the fluid V2 squared plus rho of the fluid GH2. And this is Bernoulli's equation. This equation relates the pressure, the elevation, and the speed or for a fluid. And so oftentimes to make this shorter, we'll just put P plus one half rho fluid V squared plus rho fluid GH equals a constant. For any location in a continuous fluid, that's going to be constant. So that allows us to look at things like this picture here and say, okay, the elevation is the same, right? You compare something like out here to here. The elevation is the same. So the heights are same. Those are going to drop out. So the pressure must only relate to the speed. And so I'm going to have PI plus one half the density in this case of air V2 squared equals PO plus one half the density of air V. And it doesn't have the speed out here, but let's just call this V0. And so I can find the relationship between the pressures and since V2 is a higher pressure or higher speed, so that one is higher, then this pressure has to be lower. Now let's look at some examples of this um, after we answer this clicker question. What method is used to derive Bernoulli's equation? Um, no, it's not. It is I, 41, channel 41. I was going to check to see if I could keep it 33, but other people use the clickers here, and it's better to inconvenience one class than inconvenience every other class. I did because I've got that kind of memory. 41. By the way, there's new software for the um, iPhones that was released like last night that's supposed to make it so it doesn't forget your uh, information in the middle of class. Uh, somewhere here I have, there I have. All right, let's see how we answered here. We have 5, 1, and 41. And Kayla Segura, tell us what you answered in your reasoning. Did not answer? Okay. Um, I don't even know if there's a clock in here. A, there's a clock. Okay, so we got 20 minutes. I think we're okay, but I'm going to go ahead and just give an answer then. Um, the correct answer was the work energy relation. The entire work that I did here was based on 
using that work energy relationship, we calculate the work done on each side, calculate the change in potential energy and change in kinetic energy and put together that equation. Now for some demonstrations. So we start with something simple. I have a hair dryer, which uh, I can use to cool me off at least a little. If I blow it over this paper, it pulls the paper up. Why? Why did it pull the paper up? Okay, change in pressure. Can we be more specific? Okay, there's lower air pressure at the top, higher air pressure at the bottom. Why is there lower air pressure on the top? Because the wind is going faster, have higher speed on the top. That's something that's used in all kinds of things. You can see the examples here. We have things like, you know, you're putting the perfume on. You, actually, you go like this and you walk into it, right? At least that's what I've seen on, the, on TV shows. Well, what you're doing is you are just pushing air with that little bowl. And the air goes flying over the top of a little tube. And because the air is moving, you lower the pressure. So the pressure in the perfume is higher than the pressure above it. So the pressure of the perfume pushes the perfume up into the air, gets entrained in the air and comes out. Or in chemistry lab, you use something like this for your basic, you know, you're doing a filtration thing, you put in your filter paper and you got, what's the Buchner funnel or something crazy like that? I don't know, I'm not a chemist. What you have is simply water goes down and you have a hole in the side because the water's going down, you have a lower pressure. And so it pulls air in. You put your little hose on that and it's lower than abstract pressure, allowing you to put a lower pressure beneath your filter paper so that you have something to help pull the liquid through. Sorry, I couldn't make that out. Turn the volume up. That's the maximum. I still can't hear what you were saying over there at Southwestern. Yeah, that's, anybody else here better than me? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay, so they're just talking. Okay, next demonstration here. Back to my blow dryer. And of course, you might have seen this at all kinds of museums, but really not exciting right there, right? But if I rotate it, I can get the ping pong ball so it's now clearly not over the nozzle. Right? It's quite a ways out from being over the nozzle. And eventually it falls. So why, and this is actually a clicker question, how is it possible for the blow dryer to hold that ping pong ball in the air when it's not over the nozzle? Um, oh, yes, you're right. Now it's working. Sorry about that. All right, let's end this here. This time we have a spread. And Cleus uh, Antunes, what is your answer and your reasoning for it? I use D. Okay. Um, the reason why I, I use D is because, you know, the air passing below the ball is, I mean, it's, it's moving faster, which means it brings the ball up, I guess. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's explore this. Let's look at what's going on now of course we can't show where the air is right it doesn't it's not opaque here 
But we have the ball here, and I have air blowing like this. If I look at the ball, if there's no air flowing on it, and let's ignore the buoyant force because it's a very small buoyant force, then what force, there's only a single force, do I have acting on that ball? Force of gravity. So I have a force of gravity that's pushing down on it. Force of gravity equals mg. So naturally, of course, Newton's second law says it should have a downward acceleration. It should start falling. With this air blowing, when I had it vertical, you know, the air would just stream on either side equally. But when I tip it over, because it has a force pulling down, it's actually going to go down. So I have the air is more going over the top and not so much going over the bottom. And so I'm going to have faster air over the top because it falls down, leaving it more convenient for the air to go over the top. But if the air goes over the top, then my speed of the air in the top is going to be greater than the speed of air in the bottom. So from our Bernoulli relation, if the speed is faster, what happens to the pressure? It's dropping. So I'm going to have a, and I'm only going to show vertical forces here. So I'm going to have a damn, stay with the color here a downward force due to the air on the top, that's the pressure on top, multiplied by the area of the top, and an upward force in the bottom, that's the pressure in the bottom, multiplied by the area. But because, as you said, it's higher speed on top, it's a lower pressure, and so that force on top pushing down is lower than the force on bottom pushing up. And as long as it can fall down to make it so the speed on bottom is zero and the speed on top is fast enough to make the difference in those two forces equal to the gravitational force, I can keep it in that air flow. But if I, if I tip it too much, then I don't get the ability to have enough upward force and it falls. Now this is also relevant to things like tornadoes, right? When we have tornadoes, which we do occasionally, we're supposed to do things like go down to the basement, right? Yeah. Which I, I got a bed down there, so it's okay. And that's where my television is. But what are the concerns when you have a tornado? Your roof flies off is one of our biggest concerns. Why does the roof fly off? Yeah. You have air blowing over the top, so the pressure is lower. I mean, we really worry about usually our roofs falling down on us. We build our houses to hold the roof up not to hold the roof down. Obviously in tornado country, you have to hold it down a little bit because when the air blows over the top, you have less pressure on top and the air pressure inside the house, pop it off. So it's not that the air takes it off as much as the air inside pushes it off. And so that, you know, that says, well, why don't we open up the doors on the side of the house and get the air flowing through the house? Well, first of all, that would cause a lot of damage in the house. Um, but second, you probably wouldn't have a good airflow and you, you still would be opening up your house to, to lots of problems. So this Bernoulli effect, we see in a lot of daily things, especially living out here, California and tornadoes aren't such a big deal. Things like chimneys. Why does your chimney draw? A little bit of breeze, just like two miles an hour is enough to make the chimney draw well because you have a slightly lower air pressure where you have the air blowing over the chimney than you have inside the house where you have still air. Yes, hot air does expand and thus the expanded air floats up, but just a little bit of breeze makes that chimney draw much, much, much better. Oh, I wanted to go to the pictures in between. Back when I was in graduate school, I used to love flying home to California and sitting next to the person and explain to them how an airplane flies because if you don't know how an airplane flies, you simply know, oh, the airplane flies through the air. They've got this all figured out. It's safe. And airplanes are incredibly safe, right? Your chances of death from flying an airplane much lower than your chances of death from, you know, driving your car. I think it's lower than your chances of death from walking. Right? So they're pretty safe. But what makes an airplane fly? That wing shape is a big part of it. Notice the wing is not symmetrical. The front side has a curve. Have you ever wondered why the front side has a curve and the back side is kind of sharp? <laughs> well, the reason is to cut the air. Perfect catch. 
to cut the air no matter what the angle is. If you made it sharp like the other end, if you change the angle, it would, you know, be very sensitive. But with that curved air, it cuts, or edge, it cuts the air pretty evenly. And the top of the wing has a length that is much longer than the length on the bottom of the wing. So when it cuts the air, right, the air is just sitting here hanging out. The wing comes by and the air goes like that. So the molecules basically, you know, they started together, they end together. But the one on top had to cover a lot more wing distance. So if you take the distance it had to travel over the wing divided by the time, it has a faster speed on top. And because it has this faster speed on top, the pressure on the top is lower. You have the same cross-sectional area for top and bottom, so you just take that cross-sectional area times the difference in pressure, and that's what we call the lift force for an airplane. Question. With more surface, does it cause more area? Yes, with more surface, you have more area, and hence you're going to have more lift. So like, is that a question? No, okay. So when an airplane is at low speed, like taking off or landing, they'll actually want to make the wing a little bit larger so you have more area, so you'll have more lift for the same speed because they're not going as fast. But with the, uh, with the top of the wing having more surface area, mm -hmm. does that cause they have to be careful not having too much surface area because of the pressure, the area times the pressure will equal out a little bit? The, this, okay, what, what he's saying is, is it possible to have too much lift so you can't come down, right? And yes, especially for aircraft that fly at very high speeds at high altitude, the wing has to be very close to the same length top and bottom for their high speed travel to stay in the air. But then when they slow down, they don't have enough lift. So they have to be very careful on those parameters for the aircraft. So that's how an airplane works. It's just based on the difference in speed over the top and bottom. When you start thinking about, it's just the difference in airspeed over the top and bottom, it doesn't seem quite as sound. A sailboat works in the same way. A sailboat, that was one of the P classes I took at college. <laughs> I still remember one of the questions for our final exam. We had to define a boat as a hole in the water that you throw money into. That was an actual test question. So that sailboat, you have the sail. And of course, anyone who's done any sailing knows that you want to take that sail and you Pull it in until you have a tight sail, so it's not luffing, not flapping in the breeze. And so that sail forms this curved shape. And the airflow is pretty much straight across the backside. You just have still air on the backside with air going past that still air. But on the front side, it has to do like it does on the top of the wing. And so you have that same difference of the air blowing a longer distance on the outside of that curve. So that means you have the force, as shown in this picture, the force in the back is pushing you off to the side. The force in the front not pushing back as hard. What direction would this boat naturally accelerate? Yeah, its natural acceleration should be this direction according to Newton's second law. So your boat doesn't just have the sail. What else are you going to have to have to keep your boat so you can sail where you want to go? Okay. A centerboard or daggerboard or a keel. You have something that if you look at the side of the boat, you put something like a daggerboard that goes down the middle of the boat. And so that's going to give you something that the, eh, that's a horrible color for this point. It's going to give you something that the water will provide a force against it. So if your net force was pushing the boat in this picture to the top, the water is going to provide a force back like that so that you can go straight, right? So you'll have the horizontal port components add to zero and you go straight. Of course, you also have some torque issues to worry about here because this force in the sail is of course up high. And so in this picture, using my right hand rule, the radius going from the center of the boat to the force, it's gonna be going up. And then my net force, matching the picture here, my net force is gonna be like that, and it creates a torque that's going this direction, which means the boat wants to tip over. We love this in the sailing class because when the boat wants to tip over, you have to supply a counter torque. And how do you supply the counter torque? You climb out on the edge. We call it hiking. And so we'd get, you know, it was 
Ryan Whitley, Philip Tallman, and me in our boat. <laughs> Little, what, 12 foot vagabonds, kind of a too many people for the boat. So we would have like Phil and I would hike up on this side, and then we'd have Brian hike on the low side so we'd have more fun until we capsized. But, you know, boats use this, they use the technology we're learning right here. If you watch the America's Cup races, which when I was in college, if it was a sport, you know, I watched it. And the America's Cup races, back when America first <laughs> was not necessarily winning it every year, right? It didn't originate in America, it originated in Great Britain, but we won it for over 100 years straight. And so that's how it got the name America's Cup. Well, when America wasn't as dominant, after one of the competitions, I think it's Michael Fay, guy from New Zealand, used the, the letter of the law rather than the spirit of law to immediately challenge the Americans. And when he does that, instead of the defender making the rules, he gets to make the rules. And he said, let's race in these really huge boats because the bigger the boat, the faster it can go. But he made a mistake. It had always up to that point been understood that America's Cup was raced in, I think they're, what, 12 meter boats. It's a very complicated method by which they measure that. But, and they had to be single hole. He didn't specify. He just said, it's got it can be a big hurricane boat. And so they said, okay, we're going to make a catamaran. Catamarans are always faster because the catamaran, you have two holes. And as soon as you get that torque pulling over, one of the hole comes out of the water, less resistance to the water, and now you have a counter torque. And so you basically have less water contact, less water friction. You have a bigger net force forward, can go faster. And so the Americans built a catamaran. He said, that's foul. That's not following the spirit of the rules, which was really funny because he hadn't followed the spirit of the rules. Anyway, international court said, no, that, that's illegal. And they raced and they won easily. They had such a big advantage, they decided to try using an airplane wing on their sailboat. And of course, if you watch the America's Cup today, you see they still do that because they found that they were able to actually sail faster using a deformable wing so they could deform it to the either side than using a traditional sail. They didn't use it that first year because the sailors weren't comfortable with it. All right. You guys ever seen these things on an airplane? They're called a pitot tube that they use to measure the airspeed. Little holes sticking out and stuff. They have these things that they use in the airplane. It has a hole in the center. The, these are two different versions. Here you have the hole in the center so air could go in. But the air actually can't go in because you have it blocked. And so you have zero airspeed at that hole. But then you have another hole on the side here where air flows past. And so using our Bernoulli relation, I would have P1 plus one half density of air, V1 squared plus density of air, G H1 is equal to P2 plus one half density of air, V2 squared plus rho air, air, g h2. Well, the height one and height two are the same. So we can immediately subtract those away. So those terms are meaningless because their heights are the same. The speed of the air at position one is zero, so that disappears. And so what I can do is say, hmm, p1 minus p2 is equal to one half the density of air times v2 squared. So by measuring the pressure difference, I can get the speed. Well, the pressure difference is just measured using a manometer. So using that manometer, the pressure difference is the density of the fluid times g times the height you measure. And so simply by measuring that height, you can calculate the airspeed, which is really genius. Oh, crud. And I guess we won't do 